Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar on chronic kidney disease and osteoporosis. My name is Eric Brudet Champagne. I'm the Capture the Fracture Coordinator at IOF, and I will be today's moderator for the session. Before introducing our speakers, Professor Peter Abelling and Dr. Essa Abu Halaika, I'd like to inform you that all participants are automatically muted for the duration of the webinar. I would also like to encourage you to ask questions during the session by typing them into the question box of the control panel that you can see on the right-hand side of your screen. I will voice the questions to Professor Peter Abelling and Dr. Essa Abu Halaika during the question and answer session planned at the end of the two presentations. With that being said, I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Professor Peter Abelling. Peter Thank Abelling. You, is, uh, sorry, <laughs> I just wanted to read your uh, presentation, your introduction first, and then I'll, uh, I'll give you the uh, control to share your slides. Uh, so Professor Abelling is the head of the Department of Medicine at the School of Clinical Sciences at Monash Health uh, Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences at the Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. His research interests include musculoskeletal health and diseases, public health aspects of vitamin D, including effects on muscle function, bone and diabetes, post-transplantation osteoporosis, and osteoporosis in men. Professor Belling was associate editor of the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research, editor of Clinical Endocrinology, and editor of Chief of Bone Reports. He currently serves on the editorial board of Osteoporosis International. He is chair of the board for Healthy Bones Australia, board member of the IOF, past president of the Endocrine, uh, Endocrine Society of Australia, and past president of the ANZBMS. He has over 440 peer-reviewed publications. And I will now leave the floor to Professor Abelling. Thank you so much, Eric, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, it's uh, very good uh, to um, be here. I'm sorry I can't be with you in Qatar personally, but hopefully uh, the information I share with you today will be of benefit uh, for your day-to-day -day practice in osteoporosis. These are my disclosures shown here. And what I'd like to do today is speak about causes of increased fracture risk in chronic kidney disease and how to assess fracture risk in these patients with chronic kidney disease who commonly have osteoporosis as well. And some of the things I'll be discussing today are the use of bone densitometry using dense, uh, DEXA, the FRAC score, PTH assays, and bone-specific alkaline phosphatase assays. I'd also like to discuss the effects of CKD on bone using novel imaging modalities such as trabecular bone score or TBS, uh, advanced hip analysis on DEXA, and high resolution peripheral quantitative CT scanning. And some of the work on these imaging modalities were done in our department. And then I, I think what's important really to all of us is how do we best treat our patients with CKD uh, to reduce fractures. So I'm going to discuss the evidence we have with, for bisphosphonates, denosumab, teriparatide, as well as the safety of bisphosphonates and denosumab in CKD studies. And there are some important uh, recent studies I'd like to discuss in this regard. If we think about hip fractures in patients with CKD, we find that depending on the stage of CKD, and uh, if we think about stage five CKD, when patients are on hemodialysis, they have really the highest risk of hip fracture, but there is still this relationship with age. So you can see that with the progression of stage of CKD, there's an increasing risk of hip fracture, and that's highest in the patients uh, who are on dialysis. And in the patients with uh, stage four and five CKD, we have to think not about osteoporosis so much, but about what type of CKD, metabolic bone disorder, is present. And this involves bone, of course, with renal osteodystrophy uh, shown here, but it also involves soft tissue calcifications 
and mineral abnormalities, such as those involving phosphate, calcium, FGF23, calcitriol, sclerostin, and D DKK1. So all of these combine in our patients with CKD stage four to five, and we have to consider uh, what one of these, in particular, renal osteodystrophy is present. And this adds to an increased cardiovascular risk, increased fracture risk, and increased mortality risk. So when we're thinking about classifying renal osteodystrophy, we use the TMV classification system. And here we group it into turnover, mineralization, and volume. And uh, the turnover, of course, can be low, absent, normal, or high. Mineralization can be low or absent or normal or high. And the volume can be low, normal, or high. So this is a good framework for considering renal osteodystrophy. And if we try and uh, classify this according to a three-dimensional uh, graph uh, shown here, I think this is a good way of thinking about it. If we think about um, low um, um, adynamic bone disease, they will have low bone mass as well as a low turnover. And if we think about the opposite, where there's hyperparathyroidism, uh, they can have low bone mass but increased turnover, uh, whereas mixed osteopathy is in the middle, and where with osteomalacia we get low mineralization and uh, lowish bone volume. So this is a good way of thinking of the TMV classification system. Now, the old way of thinking about classifying uh, renal osteodystrophy was to measure PTH. And if this was high, uh, we would consider this to be high turnover renal osteodystrophy. We would treat with vitamin D or a calcium sensing receptor agonist, sinicalcet, or if uh, the PTH was above the threshold, we would continue treatment and monitor PTH. If with the treatment, the PTH was below the KDGO threshold, we would stop treatment. So this was an older way of thinking of it. But now what we should really do is assess overall fracture risk in our patients, assess bone turnover, whether this is low, uh, moderate or high. And we should consider the use of an anabolic agent for low turnover with or without vitamin D as necessary and an anti-resortive agent for high turnover with or without vitamin D as necessary. And then in both cases, of course, we would monitor the treatment response. So I think these are the, the paradigms I'd like to discuss today about assessing fracture risk and assessing bone turnover in patients with CKD so we can treat them in the best possible way. So uh, there has been a, a guideline update from KDGO, which is the largest international body looking at uh, CKD metabolic bone disorders. And in patients with uh, grade 3A to grade 5D CKD with evidence of CKD MBD and all risk factors for osteoporosis, they now recommend that bone density testing should be done. Uh, if the results will impact treatment decisions. Uh, they say it's also reasonable to perform a bone biopsy if the type of renal osteodystrophy will also impact treatment decisions. And what they do say is we don't know the optimal PTH level in this uh, class of patients, but you should use vitamin D3 supplements to correct vitamin D deficiency and reserve the use of calcitriol and vitamin D analogues uh, with patients with grade four to grade five CKD uh, with severe and progressive hyperparathyroidism. And unfortunately, based on the studies that have been done in patients with osteoporosis, we know that anti-fracture efficacy for any osteoporosis treatment in patients with grades four to five CKD is lacking. So um, the European uh, guidelines are that uh, 
patient should be assessed for fracture risk with a history, looking at age, sex, history of a prior fracture, presence of diabetes, because we know the coexistence of diabetes with CKD increases the fracture risk uh, even further, as does the use of glucocorticoids. And then we can do bone imaging using uh, DEXA, which all of you would have access to. And in those of us who are fortunate enough to have a high resolution PQCT scanner, uh, we could use that. And then we could use serum biomarkers, calcium, phosphate, PTH, 25-hydroxy vitamin D, total and bone specific alkaline phosphatase um, and P1NP and CTX and TRAP5B to measure bone turnover. And we should exclude uh, monoclonal gammopathies with a protein of electrophoresis. And then we should also use FRAX to assess the absolute fracture risk. They there have, they've then have a fairly um, complex pathway depending on whether the PTH is low moderate or elevated. And in all of these cases, uh, the bone specific alkaline phosphatase is also measured. And in the cases with a low PTH, they do suggest a bone biopsy to exclude the presence of osteomalacia. Now in, in the patients uh, with moderate uh, PTH levels, in those uh, with um, a bone-specific alkaline phosphatase that's uh, above 25, uh, they also suggest a bone biopsy may be required to rule out a mineralization defect. And uh, then the pathway would select denosumab if uh, that was ruled out. But um, I think most people would find a bone-specific alkaline phosphatase of greater than 25 and a normal PTH uh, somewhat reassuring and may not go on to do a bone biopsy. And in the pathway uh, with the PTH that's uh, about nine, above nine times the upper limit of normal, uh, in those who have a high bone specific alkaline phosphatase, uh, they would have severe secondary hyperparathyroidism and those who would have a, a lower bone specific alkaline phosphatase, the use of um, calcium emetics or um, active vitamin D could be considered as well as parathyroidectomy. So in these cases, uh, there'd be a strong consideration of treating the hyperparathyroidism even either medically or surgically before moving on to anti-resorptive therapy. And I guess why denosumab was chosen here uh, is the data that I'll show you um, further on. And that's because uh, bisphosphonates are um, actually metabolized by the kidney, whereas denosumab is not, and it's metabolized by the cup for cells in the liver. So um, what we've been doing is looking at the role of trabecular bone score in CKD uh, BMD, as well as others. And overall, um, this is a measure of the uh, indirect measure of uh, the trabecular um, microarchitecture in the vertebrae. Uh, and it's done on a simple DEXA image of the spine. And I think it adds to the value of a conventional DEXA scan. And the TBS is lower in patients receiving hemodialysis. And the TBS is also associated with prevalent non-vertebral fractures and uh, is independent of the femoral neck bone density. So it gives us additional information in trying to assess fracture risks in our patients with CKD. The other thing that we can do is using an image from a DEXA scan, we can try and use uh, advanced hip analysis by DEXA to assess fracture risk in the later stages of CKD. And this was work done by one of my PhD students looking at a cohort of patients who are going on to uh, transplantation, kidney transplantation. And here we can measure the cortical bone parameters, particularly the cortical thickness. And when uh, a measure of strength was measured um, compared with a normal control population from the Geelong osteoporosis study, uh, we found the buckling ratio uh, was higher and uh, it was associated with an increased risk of vertebral fractures in these patients with uh, late stage CKD. There was a relationship with age as well, 
so age had an effect uh, and also cortical thickness uh, was much lower in patients with CKD irrespective of their age and this was also associated with an increased risk for vertebral fracture. You may think it's surprising that the cortical thickness is associated with an increased risk of um, vertebral fracture but a lot of the strength of the vertebra even though it's mainly trabecular bone is conferred by the thin cortical shell of the vertebra. So I think that would explain that uh, association. The other thing that can be used um, is um, high resolution peripheral quantitative uh, CT. And uh, this is uh, very useful. And we look at sites in the distal tibia and the distal radius. And uh, what we see is in, in these patients, um, with CKD and in particular um, the um, hemodialysis patients, there is a rap rapid and marked cortical bone loss. And you can see from uh, this one, uh, compared with an age match woman above, there, there's uh, absolute loss of cortical bone and almost no cortical bone left in, in this situation. So this, uh, I think, illustrates it very dramatically that there is quite a high degree of cortical bone loss uh, in the setting of late stage uh, CKD and particularly during dialysis. So we know that uh, fract fractures are multifactorial and if we're thinking about uh, fractures, um, there are many things that are important and uh, remodeling is also important and this will be impacted by genetics and nutrition uh, and hormones and that will also determine bone mass and the material properties of bone as well as remodeling will determine the bone strength and genetics will also determine the shape and architecture of the bone which can contribute to bone strength and then the loss of postural reflexes soft tissue padding and falls uh, will all uh, alter the risk of having the actual fracture so the, these are all things we consider even in patients with CKD. And uh, originally the 2009 uh, recommendations for patients with CKD, MBD, didn't think that bone dens density testing was of much benefit. But uh, the revised uh, 2016 recommendations, uh, which I think were published in 2017, uh, said that uh, bone density testing is useful to assess fracture risk, particularly if an increased fracture risk would uh, make you treat the patient with uh, an antiresorptive or anabolic drug. So there's been a turnaround amongst nephrologists to realise that bone density testing actually does have a role in patients with CKD. And uh, what was important in turning uh, this around were uh, prospective data in pre-dialysis CKD patients in the Health ABC study. It was a large study of over 2,700 patients followed up for 11 years. And uh, there were 21% with CKD and they all had spine and hip bone density at study entry. And during the follow-up, um, there were 98 fractures uh, in the CKD cohort and obviously more in the 79% uh, of patients who didn't have CKD. And if one looked for the hazard ratio for an incident fracture for every standard deviation lower femoral neck T-score, uh, we can see that this uh, was perhaps even uh, more strongly related uh, when it was adjusted uh, here for age, race, sex, body mass index, and hyperparathyroidism, vitamin D levels, uh, as and uh, also uh, the same thing was seen with PTH uh, shown on in the right hand panel. So it was just effective in patients with CKD, if not more than in patients without CKD. And this was using the femoral neck site. However, if one used the lumbar spine site, uh, this uh, didn't predict incident fractures and forearm bone density unfortunately was not assessed at baseline. So the best information we have is that the hip bone density measurements uh, will be more useful in patients with CKD 
And perhaps this is because they're more reflective of cortical bone. And we know that cortical bone is adversely effective in affected in patients with CKD. So we know that DEXA has limitations in patients with CKD as well as in uh, other individuals. It doesn't assess bone microarchitectural bone strength. It doesn't assess bone turnover, mineralization, or the type of renal osteodystrophy. And we can't base treatment decisions on the DEXA measurement alone. We have to look at other clinical risk factors as well. And uh, to take this into account, uh, of course, the guidelines do suggest uh, consideration of a bone biopsy. Uh, and if patients have CKD stage three or later with uh, abnormalities of CKD and MBD. Um, but I think all of us have difficulty accessing bone biopsy. So often we have to think about using other non-invasive measures to uh, try and eliminate, if you like, a dynamic bone disease where we wouldn't want to use anti-resorptive therapy. So um, what type of renal osteodystrophy is common? Well, this was a study from 10 years ago now that looked at bone biopsies from 630 end-stage renal disease patients. And uh, there was quite a large proportion of patients with adynamic bone disease, about 58%, but a very low likelihood of osteomalacia, which was more common uh, in former times. So roughly about 50% of patients might have adynamic bone disease with CKD MB, uh, MBD, but only a small proportion would have osteomalacia. And these patients might be recognized by biochemical features such as hypocalcemia, uh, very high PDH and bone specific alkaline phosphatase. Uh, and probably it's not seen as much because we tend to use vitamin D supplements more commonly and aluminium isn't used uh, any longer as a phosphate binder, which could cause osteomalacia. So uh, this was a study uh, looking at um, using uh, non-invasive markers to diagnose renal osteodystrophy type in end-stage renal disease. And probably the one we'd be most interested in is discriminating low, uh, renal, uh, low turnover renal osteodystrophy from non-low turnover renal osteodystrophy. And uh, the area under the curve was quite good for both PTH and bone-specific alkaline phosphatase, uh, but uh, not, not really too much better for the combination. In fact, it was some way in between uh, both of them uh, individually. But uh, if one was looking at the cutoff for PTH, it was 103, and for bone-specific alkaline phosphatase, it was 33. And then similarly, we could uh, work out the difference between high versus non-high renal osteodystrophy. And here the cutoff for the PTH level was 323 and uh, for bone specific alkaline phosphatase 42. So again, the area under the curve was um, about 0.72 for that discrimination. So now I'm going to turn to the evidence we have for treatments in patients uh, we commonly use for osteoporosis. And what data do we have in, pa in patients with CKD? Well, if we consider teriperitide and the fracture prevention trial, um, there were low numbers of CKD patients, but they were divided into two groups, those with normal renal function and EGFR of greater than 80 and those with abnormal renal function with an EGFR of less than uh, or equal to 80 mils per minute. And you can see from the graph here uh, that if we look at vertebral fractures, uh, there was, uh, and non-vertebral fractures, the risk in spinal and non-spinal fractures was equivalent in both groups. And the changes in spine and femoral neck bone density were also similar, and I haven't shown that here. Um, so interestingly, the serum calcium does increase in patients on teriperitide, and the uric acid also increased in patients with CKD. Uh, 
So this is something to be aware of if patients do have a low EGFR and we put them on teriferritide, they might develop symptomatic gout. Uh, but there wasn't any symptomatic gout apart from this increase in uric acid in the study and there was no acute renal failure with the use of teriperitide or symptomatic hypercalcemia or nephrolithiasis. But I think most of us would consider that if the serum PDH is more than twice the upper limit of normal, um, perhaps uh, intermittent uh, use of parathyroid hormone uh, may not be effective uh, with this high background level of PTH. These are prospective fracture data in CKD stage 5D, just showing the burden of uh, fractures that we see and how they could be predicted using uh, bone alkaline phosphatase and total hip bone density and femoral neck bone density. So if we look at the prediction for bone alkaline phosphatase, the area under the curve was 0.77. For total hip bone density 0.66 and uh, for area, area under the curve for femoral neck bone density 0.61 and uh, one third radius 0.58. But the lumbar spine bone density again was not predictive. And PTH levels either less than 150 or greater than 300 uh, were also uh, predictive of um, fractures. So it, it's very useful to measure both bone density and PTH levels in hemodialysis patients to uh, predict fracture risk. So what about sinicalcet? Is there any role of, of sinicalcet in treating secondary hyperparathyroidism in reducing clinical fractures? Well, the EVOLVE trial had a primary outcome of looking at all-cause mortality and non-fatal cardiovascular events and had five years of follow-up. But the secondary outcome was clinical fractures. Now, 12.2% uh, of patients in the Senecalcet group uh, and 13.2% in the placebo group had fractures. So there was a 1% reduction in fractures in the Senecalcet group. And this 16 to 29% fracture risk reduction was only uh, significant in anal analyses adjusted for difference in baseline characteristics, multiple fractures, and events leading to study drug discontinuation. So there wasn't a strong signal that Sinicalcet was useful at reducing fractures. Um, but what we do see is that hip, spine, and wrist fractures are reduced by parathyroidectomy in CKD 5D patients. And uh, this was uh, from a hemodialysis uh, study of uh, 13 years of follow-up with uh, um, uh, over 20,000 20, patients with 15,000 patients not having a parathyroidectomy and about 6,000 having a parathyroidectomy. And if we look at the cumulative hip fracture risks, you can see that over time, even at, at about uh, 12 to two years after the parathyroidectomy, that there is a beginning of a divergence of these curves so that the hip fracture rate is halved in patients who have a parathyroidectomy. And uh, there was uh, matching for age, sex, dialysis duration and vitamin D. So, um, there was a 32% risk, lower risk of hip fractures uh, uh, in this study. So parathyroidectomy seems a very useful thing for patients with continuing uh, secondary or worsening hyperparathyroidism in patients on dialysis. And hyperparathyroidism also, uh, if it extends after a post, after a renal transplant, this predicts fractures five years after transplant. And so uh, the risk of having a, a fracture if you had continuing hyperparathyroidism was increased 7.5 fold, as opposed to having pre-transplant osteopenia, which increased the risk 2.7 fold. So obviously patients with pre-transplant osteopenia and continuing um, hyperparathyroidism after the transplant are most at risk of fractures. So we shouldn't forget about hyperparathyroidism in the post-transplant period. Now, 
information we have on other agents is that residronate decreased vertebral fracture risk in patients uh, with mild CKD. And uh, this shows uh, patients uh, with a, a creatinine clearance less than 30. There were 232 and significant reduction in the patients treated with residronate uh, with a 56% reduction and a 45% reduction in those with an EGFR of 30 to 50. So um, this is useful information that residronate uh, reduces vertebral fractures in patients with low creatinine clearance. But just to remember that bisphosphonate clearance is reduced by 70% in severe CKD, and some people would consider using uh, twice weekly dosing instead of weekly dosing of a bisphosphonate for this reason. We looked at uh, the FREEDOM trial and the risk of um, frac fractures uh, at the spine in CKD stage two to three. And what we found is that vertebral fractures were uh, reduced equivalently uh, in uh, stage two and three C CKD, as well as those with normal renal function. Unfortunately, there were only 76 patients with CKD stage four, so we couldn't assess vertebral fra fracture risk reduction over three years in that group, but there was no interaction between renal function and fracture rate. What about the use of denosumab in dialysis patients? Uh, there might be some risks associated with it. And uh, this is a Japanese study where they looked at a randomized control trial of 48 hemodialysis patients uh, treated with either conventional doses of denosumab, 60 milligrams, six monthly, or intravenous uh, lendronate, which we certainly don't have available in Australia. And this was given at a dose of 900 micrograms every four weeks. And then they followed up bone density at 12 months. So uh, even uh, though these patients were having hemodialysis, uh, both anti-resorptive agents increased spinal bone density equivalently by 6% over 12 months. And uh, femoral neck bone density was maintained over the 12 month period. And there were, as was distal radius um, um, bone density. So there were six cases of hypocalcemia in the denosumab group, and three patients had severe hypocalcemia. So this is uh, something we need to be aware of when we do use denosumab in patients with uh, stage four or five CKD, that even with using calcium and vitamin D supplements, there, there can be a risk of um, hypocalcemia. This occurs about seven to 10 days um, after the injection maximally. So in these patients, we should certainly recommend calcium and vitamin D supplements and check the serum calcium about a week after the denosumab injection if we're using it. Uh, one way of um, preventing it would be to use low dose active vitamin D or calcitriol. So uh, this is another study I thought I would share with you, and it was the effect of pre-transplant zoledronic acid on turnover mineralization and volume by bone histomorphometry 12 months after kidney transplant. And what we can see is on the left, the um, uh, control group looking at turnover mineralization and volume and uh, what we can see in the uh, zoledronic in the control group that the number of patients uh, with normal bone turnover or low bone turnover improved uh, and uh, the number with normal uh, turnover was slightly greater in those treated with uh, zoledronic acid with mineralization uh, mineralization returned to normal in in more patients who were treated with uh, zoledronic acid uh, perhaps, and in, in volume, the changes were fairly similar in both groups after kidney transplantation. Uh, so unfortunately, the pre-transplant zoledronic acid didn't uh, prevent decreases in trabecular number or increases in trabecular separation due to the glucocorticoids uh, given after the transplant. Uh, but BMD and cortical thickness increased and cortical porosity decreased but it did in both groups. 
So perhaps uh, we need to give more um, zoledronic acid in the post-transplant phase to have an effect on trabecular bone as well as cortical bone after a kidney transplant. We've also uh, gone on to look at the renal safety of seven to 10 years of denosumab treatment, and this was just recently published. Uh, and again, uh, it, the um, denosumab treatment uh, reduced fractures uh, equally in, in, over the 10 years. But what I wanted to show you um, was that it was very safe and there wasn't a progression of stage of CKD uh, in patients who were followed up to 10 years of denosumab treatment. And uh, the majority of individuals um, stayed within uh, their own grade of grade zero and zero to zero. And we can see this uh, with all the stages of CKD that are shown here, stage two, uh, 3A and 3B. And uh, very few uh, numbers changing from uh, one grade from baseline and really uh, a very safe option for preventing uh, progression of, of renal uh, uh, failure if we're using denosumab. And interestingly, less than 2% of pa patients in either arm had a maximal post baseline shift in hypocalcemia from grade zero to two. So there wasn't, uh, hypocalcemia was very infrequent. However, what I thought I would share with you is some recent data looking at the safety of oral bisphosphonates in patients with stage 3B or uh, worse CKD. And this was looked at uh, in two cohorts, one from the UK and one from Catalonia. And uh, they had eight to nine years of follow-up and both databases were linked to hospital records and also to end-stage renal disease registers. And that they were very careful at matching cases to a larger number of controls by propensity score matching. And what, what happened is that the users of uh, bisphosphonates had a greater progression of um, CKD over the years of follow-up. So the number needed to harm by treating these patients with uh, stage 3B or uh, later CKD uh, for five years was only 20 patients uh, to get a worsening of renal uh, uh, failure. And uh, a history of fracture was more likely to experience stage worsening, uh, has a ratio of 1.4 uh, than without a fracture and women were more likely to have worsening of EGFR than men who didn't. So in postmenopausal women with osteoporosis and uh, an EGFR of um, less than 45, um, you only need to treat uh, 20 for five years to get a worsening of uh, EGFR. So I think that's something uh, that's going to be the best evidence we have. There isn't enough study from randomized control trials to look at the safety of oral bisphosphonates, and we're not sure about the safety of intravenous bisphosphonates uh, in, in this setting. So I'd just like to um, conclude by saying what we want to do is prevent fractures in patients with CKD. We can do this by correcting vitamin D, phosphorus, calcium, and PTH. We can assess bone density and turnover status, and we can assess turnover status using PTH and bone-specific alkaline phosphatase. We could then classify patients as having low turnover, and we could use an osteoanabolic. And if they have high bone turnover, we could use an anti-resorptive. So what I'd like you to take home today is that fracture risk and fracture-related complications are higher in patients with CKD. The DEXA T-score helps classify fracture risk in our CKD patients. We probably need more information about the novel imaging methods I've discussed today before they come common practice, but at least we could use TBS, I think, to help fracture prediction. Uh, PTH and bone turnover markers, particularly the bone-specific alkaline phosphatase, 
uh, can help guide treatment in CKD. And bone biopsies are really only needed when turnover and or osteomalacia cannot be determined non-invasively using the PTH and bone-specific alkaline phosphatase. And I think we can be reassured that the likelihood of osteomalacia is fairly low in Western populations. And an individual and tailored approach to managing bone disease is critical in your CKD patients. And based on the recent study I just presented, I think we should think more about monitoring EGFR every six months in CKD stage 3B to 5 patients on oral bisphosphonates. We, we don't have any evidence yet on intravenous zoledronic acid in this regard but probably we should do that in, in those cases as well. So just uh, like to thank you for your at attendance and show Yasna Alexova, who was my former PhD student who was in involved uh, in uh, providing some of this data. As you, uh, as you can see, Monash University is relatively young. It's 61 years old and a very large international university with um, over 78,000 students. So thank you for your attention today. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation, Professor Belling. Uh, to the attendees, uh, Professor Belling will answer your questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, so I encourage you to type any questions that you may have into the question box uh, on the uh, on the right hand side of your screen. With that said, it's a pleasure for me to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Essa Abu Halaika. So Dr. Essa Buhalaika obtained his MD degree from Weill Cornell Medicine, Qatar in 2011. He went on to complete his internal medicine residency at Virginia Commonwealth University, followed by a nephrology fellowship and transplant nephrology fellowship at the New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell. He's also received the Young Investigator Award at the American Transplant Society Congress and the Best Oral Research Award at the American College of Physicians Fifth Internal Medicine Conference in Qatar. He's also been certified by the American Board in Internal Medicine and Nephrology and received the AST Certificate in Transplant Nephrology. It is now a pleasure to leave the floor to Dr. Essa Abuhalaika for his presentation. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm just going to share my slides and uh, is it visible for everyone? Yes, this is perfect. Okay, excellent. All right. Um, so I, I'd like to think of my presentation as an extension um, to Professor Stock, um, and I have nothing to disclose. Um, so essentially, um, as we've heard earlier, osteoporosis is a significant cause of morbidity mortality in the kidney population, specifically post kidney transplant. And as we know that um, end stage kidney disease have much higher risk of fracture in the, compared to the general population, it's even a little bit higher uh, post transplant. It goes up um, 34%. Um, and this is probably because of pre-existing bone disorders during the uh, advanced kidney disease stage, um, a lot of these patients have persistent or uh, secondary or tertiary hyperparathyroidism. And of course, many of our transplant population uh, have or are receiving a glucocorticoid therapy. So um, as we know, with the recent update in the uh, Cadigo uh, guidelines, um, in the past, we haven't been screening our patients uh, for uh, bone densitometry. Um, however, now um, it is recommended to do it for all stages one to five, including post kidney transplant. And the recommendation is specifically uh, in patients who have performed kidney transplant to look at it between six to one year post transplant. However, there wasn't really good evidence on what is the treatment guidelines or what do we do with that data. So, we decided to look into our uh, population um, in the Middle East um, to evaluate first the prevalence of osteoporosis post kidney transplant at one year and look at uh, other factors that can cause it. Um, and then from there, we can try to figure out ways that we can adjust or prevent osteoporosis in, in our population. 
So we look at patients who had, this is a retrospective study, and we looked at 92 patients who had kidney transplants here in Qatar. And essentially, um, these are patients that specifically had their DEXA scan done at one year post-transplant. And we would exclude any patient who um, would go um, less than 20 years in the pediatrics population. So um, our patients were majority are um, male gender, um, had a lot of them had uh, post-transplant um, diabetes um, and they're of age of 30, 45. Um, and then many of these patients received a simulacrum injection compared to ATG and um, they are on steroid maintenance. However, there are a few that are steroid free and we'll talk more about those later. So looking at their DEXA data, uh, we see that um, there's a heterogeneity in both lumbar and femoral neck T-scores. And um, majority had, uh, like the mean of the lumbar score was negative 1.3 uh, compared to negative one in the femoral neck. And if we look at the breakdown, um, we see that there's 42% that had normal um, DEXA scan compared to 31 um, that had osteopenia and 17% that had uh, osteoporosis. So it tells you that, um, you know, the, there is a significant population within our transplant that have osteoporosis. And where does that put us compared to other studies? Well, I tried to look uh, at local data um, and there was one of the bigger studies, postmenopausal women, and that was around 12%. Uh, percent. Um, so definitely it's higher than postmenopausal. Uh, and then compared to other studies looking at kidney transplant, it's it's very variable. It goes between 51% to 15%. So our study is um, maybe more on the lower end, um, and we can talk more why. So looking at the risk factors, I mean, we can notice that majority of our patients are um, on the younger age compared to other studies. Um, female gender was a significant risk factor for osteoporosis, and many of those are postmenopausal. Uh, BMI, nationality, and type of induction was, a, was not a significant factor to predict osteoporosis in those transplant population. So um, we specifically tried to see the progression of this osteoporosis and, and find patients that actually had that follow-up at three years post-transplant. Even though the numbers were small, we can see that Patients um, who had lower uh, lumbar spine scores um, were more likely to have a progression in their um, bone, uh, bone scores, and therefore a lot of them progressed into developing osteoporosis. Um, however, when we look at the subpopulation who were steroid free, um, they actually improved their scores uh, post transplantation. So. Um, this kind of tells you that there is kind of a benefit in terms of putting people off steroids post kidney transplant. And then when we look at the, you know, all what we're doing with these DEXA scans is try to predict um, the risk of fracture. So if we look at patients who actually develop fractures three years uh, post kidney transplant, um, the incidence in that population was only around 4%. And if you look at the type of fractures, um, it's all uh, non-vertebral. So we have patellar, uh, radial, scaphoid, and distal fibular. And even when we looked at their actual DEXA scans results, um, they were not really significant. Um, so only one was osteoporotic. The others were either osteopenic or had healthy um, tissue. That kind of brings up the point that maybe we need to adjust the way that we screen our patients. And, um, as um, the professor has mentioned, the uh, looking at things like the um, tubercular bone score, TBS, uh, would give us more insight on uh, the incidence of uh, non-vertebral fracture. That's maybe something that we can implement in our post-transplant population. Um, the other point that I do want to mention that in terms of treatment, all patients that had a positive uh, or osteopenic um, they were either started on an anti-resorptive, like an antiphosphonate, antibisphosphonates, or denosumab. And maybe that kind of explains why 
we're not seeing fractures as often because we're very cautious and very, uh, we start clicking early in the course. Now, just to conclude, you know, um, the prevalence of osteoporosis here in Qatar was only around 17% post-transplantation. And many of the risk factors are associated with either female gender or steward maintenance. And therefore, it is important to kind of uh, pay closer attention to that higher risk population and maybe possibly have more um, PTH control and bone disease uh, attention in that high risk population. So I'd like to conclude my talk here and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abu Halaika for this excellent presentation. Uh, we have time just for a few questions. Uh, so I thank you to all those who have uh, sent your questions in the question box. And I'll start with uh, reading out some of the questions. So the first question we had was related to uh, Professor Abelling's presentation. Uh, so this is for you, Professor Abelling. Uh, it's from uh, Rika Pollock, who's asking, can you please advise which assay to use for, uh, for bone-specific alkaline phosphatase? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Um, there are a couple of assays. One uh, is an immunoassay, the OSTase assay, and there's another one that's actually measuring the enzyme activity. So I think um, either of them would, would be fine. Um, and um, the thing about using the bone specific alkaline phosphatase is lo has a long half-life and it's not a, a, um, affected by uh, the renal failure, whereas if we use the other uh, bone formation marker P1NP, uh, the fragments do accumulate in the most commonly uh, used assay for P1NP. So uh, either of the bone specific alkaline phosphatase assays I think is fine. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Belling. And a follow-up uh, to that question was, uh, in fact, which acid do you recommend for PTH and P1MP? Yeah, so the uh, I'll talk about P1MP first. So the, the most commonly uh, used one is the Roche Alexis assay, but there is another one, uh, I think the Orion assay from um, Scandinavia, and uh, that is the one that should be used um, in patients with renal failure because it doesn't measure fragments, uh, it measures the intact molecules. So I think uh, that would be the preferred P1NP assay. And again, the PTH assay to be used would be the one uh, that uh, doesn't measure fragments and measures the intact PTH molecule, whichever you have available of, of those assays. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next question that we have is uh, also related to your uh, presentation, Professor Belling. Uh, so this question asks, how can we manage the reversible effect and rebound of DMAP after stopping it in CKD3 and 4? Yes, uh, well, that's a very good question, and it pertains to postmenopausal osteoporosis of, of, as well, because um, there, there was a study just published in JBMR um, online um, recently from Benty Langdahl, who gave uh, zoledronic acid at a couple of time points uh, after the missed uh, uh, dose of denosumab, and uh, unfortunately bone loss still occurred. So I think we, we don't really know uh, what we would use uh, in that scenario. And uh, again, when we did a study where we looked at giving denosumab for 12 months and then giving alendronate in, for 12 months. Uh, and the, the alendronate following the denosumab uh, preserved bone density in the, the majority of patients. But the caveat with that uh, study was that those patients had normal renal function. So probably if we were embarking on starting denosumab, we'd be giving that in the long term. And uh, that would have to be an understanding with the patient that we probably wouldn't be transitioning them to um, a bisphosphonate because of the problems of using bisphosphonates in these patients. Uh, and um, But probably we would use a, a weekly bisphosphonate, if, oral bisphosphonate, if we were thinking about transitioning. But I'd prefer not to in that scenario. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, 
the next question that we have is uh, also related to your, again, your uh, presentation, Professor Belling. The question is as follows. Isn't a dynamic bone disease iatrogenic rather than a natural process that can happen? Yes, so um, it, it's possible uh, it can be iatrogenic, um, but it, it, it is seen in these patients uh, with the CKD who haven't been exposed to uh, um, anti-resorptive agents. So it is a type of renal osteodystrophy that is seen. Uh, it used to be related to aluminium toxicity, um, but uh, why we see this uh, lack of responsiveness of uh, bone cells in the setting, setting of CKD to cause this adynamic bone disease is not really clear, um, but it can exist without being exposed uh, to uh, an anti-resorptive in the setting of CKD. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so we have time for maybe uh, two or three more questions at most. Uh, so this one, I think you've already touched on it before in the response to the uh, question uh, yep. just prior. But uh, if we start a DMAP in CKD patients, how long can we continue it? And yes. how can we stop okay. if we need to? Is there anything else to add to that uh, question? I think, uh, again, if you were going to start using denosumab, uh, we'd think about using it in the long term. I think the evidence we're starting to accumulate seems to be the effect of um, the rebound in CTX seems to be greater for the longer duration you've been on denosumab. Um, so I think we'd be thinking about using denosumab in the long term and not transitioning off it if we're going to start using denosumab in these patients. And that's certainly my practice in postmenopausal osteoporosis as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we'll do one question here. We'll take two more questions and then we'll conclude. So um, here, this is for uh, Dr. Abu Halaika, uh, related to you and your presentation. Was VFA assessed to rule out vertebral fractures in your population group? Uh, thank you for the excellent question. So. Um, VFA, we have not actually. Um, we did not look into it, um, but that's something definitely we can look into in the future. Okay, thank you very much. And the very last question, so for Professor Abelling once again, is the benefit of the use of oral bisphosphonate in CKD stage, stage three to five uh, outweigh the risk of deteriorating renal function? Uh, and is Ooh. there enough? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, I think that's a, a good question. And, you know, these data I presented are, are very new. They're not uh, the highest quality data from randomized control trials, but they are a signal that uh, there may be worsening of uh, renal function when we're putting patients on oral bisphosphonates who have CKD stage 3B to 5. So I think um, there's going to be an editorial, I think, coming out by Tom Nicholas in the JBMR. Uh, he'll probably be able to answer that better than me, but um, the, I think the two alternatives would be carefully monitoring the EGFR every six months uh, and or using denosumab instead. So I think we, we do have alternatives such as denosumab and, and anabolic drugs to use in this situation instead. But um, I think it, that's a very good question. And I think given uh, this recent evidence, we should uh, definitely monitor the EGFR every six months in patients on oral bisphosphonates. But I, I think the, the benefits would still outweigh the risks. Thank you very much, Professor Belling. Uh, so with that, we're gonna conclude today's session. Uh, thank you to uh, the participants for joining this webinar. We hope that you enjoyed this session. We're going to publish the recording of this webinar on the IOF website, and you will receive the link by email shortly. Um, also, you should be prompted to complete a survey, a very brief survey, immediately after the webinar. And we really appreciate your input and comments as we continuously try to deliver webinars that meet your needs. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us by email at webinar at iofbonehealth.org.
With that said, I'd like to sincerely thank Professor Peter Abelling and Dr. Essa Abu Halaika once more for their outstanding presentations. And thank you all again for your participation. Um, before we close, I would like to thank our CTF sponsor for this webinar, Lily, through whose support uh, this presentation was made possible. And with that said, I would like to wish everybody a pleasant morning, afternoon, and evening ahead on behalf of us, uh, International Osteoporosis Foundation. Thank you once again to everybody, and goodbye. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Dr. Elbakak.